Welcome to the Shower Epiphanies podcast, where we explore your hidden thoughts and desires, revealing your greatest drop the soap moments. The need to have closure in any given situation is sheer human nature. And when it comes to romantic relationships, this desire skyrockets. Has your previously failed relationship left you in immense pain? It's not uncommon for people to shy away from a new relationship after their first one fails miserably. The fear of the unknown makes them hide in a shell to prevent any future heartbreak. Relatable? Despite wanting to love and be loved, you can't take the plunge if your mind and heart are still locked somewhere in the past. Maybe you aren't aware of the power of releasing the past, or perhaps you don't know how to do it. Art Costello in his online course teaches the art of moving on from bad places to happier, more stable ones. This course can change your life for good helping you beat all kinds of negativity on the road to eternal bliss. Sign up now before the gloominess gets the better of you at expectationacademy.com. Now here's your host, Art Costello. Welcome to the Shower Epiphanies podcast. Today, I'm bringing to you Jeannie Bellinger. Jeannie Bellinger is a certified professional coach that works with successful sales representatives in various industries to improve their overall sales process, develop relationships with clients, prospective clients, and fellow business professionals, and improve their quality of life and job satisfaction. She has been a successful sales representative herself, owning and operating her own sales business for seven years before she pursued her coaching certification. Jeannie is a proud single mother of two lovely young ladies who she knows are watching her every move. Jeannie loves to spend her time with her family, friends, and enjoys an evening on the town from time to time. Jeannie, welcome to the show. Glad to have you, and I can't wait to hear your story. Oh, thank you so much, Art. Absolutely. So where would you like me to start? (laughs) Go back to when you were a little girl. All right. Well, I grew up in the Air Force. My dad was an Air Force officer, so I grew up a little bit of everywhere over the years, mostly in the Midwest. We never got PCS overseas or anything, so I spent a majority of my time growing up that way, and I really feel that growing up in the military was a major factor in who I've become as a grown woman because I have very little fear because I know if I can survive moving (laughs) every two or three years, I can handle just about anything. Because if you have to pick up and that life is the potential to be totally different in 30 days, which actually happened to us. I remember one time when I was about 11 or 12 years old, we got a call and the Air Force told my dad, in 30 days, we need you in Indiana. We got that call when we were in Chicago, but we were living in North Dakota. (laughs) So we had to travel back to North Dakota, pack up a house, and then move to Indiana in 30 days. So it's something that I realized that life changes in a minute. Doesn't that really help you though? I think that when you have change, it really is an inspiration for growth. Because anytime we experience change and we learn how to expect it and how we really start to develop and understand our expectations in a lot of ways just by the mere fact of moving that often and and having so many experiences that just add to the quality of our life. Because to me, that's what's important. The experiences we have in summation really create us into who we are. I agree for sure. Moving every so often really gave me the opportunity to live life in a way that I don't hold rock solid expectations. I'm much more flexible in my life. I'm very laid back. If I am expecting a particular thing and it doesn't happen that way, I'm like, oh, well, that's life. Because having grown up with so much change, it it definitely was a major opportunity for growth. And in fact, probably one of the major growing points for me was when we got PCS to St. Louis when I was in high school. I was super depressed because, you know, in high school, you're very super social and You make these close knit tight bonds with your friends. And then the Air Force up and made me move. And I was (laughs) mad (laughs) to be kind. When we moved here, I was sad and depressed and upset. I was like that for about three weeks. And I realized, you know what? The only person I'm hurting is me because I was trying to take it out on my parents. And they were just like, she'll get out of it. It's okay. She'll figure it out. 
And what I realized is I had been this slightly introverted, quiet, bookish little girl in all the way up to this point. And I said, nobody at this high school knows what I was like at my last school. So I can be whoever I want to be this time. So who do I want to be? And so I decided I wanted to be the social butterfly. I wanted to know everybody. So I created a goal for myself. And my goal was that in every single class, I was going to talk to one new person in my first week. So by the end of my first week of school, I had 35 new friends. See, your expectation though was that you were going to change yourself. See, I don't think that expectations from others play a very big role. I mean, yeah, we have social expectations. We have societal marriage expectations. I mean, there's expectations in everything because we can't do anything without having an expectation behind it. Right. So it's how you manage them that really matters. But what's more important is that your core expectations Mm -hmm. really set the pace for how you think and who you are because we see them in two lights, faith or fear. Yeah. And and that's my base premise with expectation therapy. Mm. Um, So I see how you can think because the people who think traditionally about expectations think about other people's expectations upon them, society's expectations, school, advertisers, there's a million of them. And I go through them a lot. But when you made that core expectation decision and created that core expectation, And see, that's where the epiphanies come in because at some point you had an epiphany and epiphanies don't have to be these huge things, but you came to the realization that, hey, no one knows me. I can be whoever I want. And there's a beauty in that. To me, that is for you to realize it is really powerful. And it shows how much control you have over you. So Absolutely. And I didn't realize how powerful that was at the time. And in fact, I didn't think it was that big a deal until much, much later in life when I was having the conversation. Because once I got into the direct sales world, when I was in my early 30s, I had ladies who were saying, well, you're so outgoing. I can't be that. And so that's when I realized, yes, you can. Yes, you can. Because that's the decision I made in my life. You can be that way. When I would tell them that story that, look, I used to be this quiet, introverted little girl. And at 15, I decided I didn't want to be that anymore. And so I went out and changed my behavior in order to reflect who I wanted to be. And so I didn't even realize the power of that decision until more than 15 years later. I was 32, 33 years old before I realized that. So it was definitely a turning point in my life for sure, because then that made going up to college a lot easier because I knew, okay, I've moved how many times in my life? And now I know that I know how to make friends now because I've done it. I did it here in St. Louis. So now I can go to school and know that I'm going to be okay no matter where I go. And so I didn't have to worry about that, which was really made for a great college experience because I knew I was going to make friends because I've done it before. The part that I find interesting about that is that what triggered for me was when people use the word, I can't. That's the fear that enters in through their expectations. They start living that fear. I can't do this. I can't do that. And becomes an excuse. Exactly. I say, I can't. And then therefore they don't, try new things. They're always so fearful about what other people think. How am I going to look? Am I not going to be smart? So that word can't is, man, that's a powerful word and the negative for people. I mean, it it, it stops them. I definitely agree. There's very little that I don't think that I can do, right? (laughs) So meaning I know how powerful I am because I've been through so much and not in a negative sense. No, it's positive. Basically, I never felt more powerful than the moment after I gave birth to my second child because she, from first contraction until the moment she was born, was three hours and 15 minutes. Wow, that's short. She she came really fast, which means I delivered her with absolutely zero drugs in my system (laughs) and that was not by choice. My first one, was I had an epidural. So when I made it through the second one going, oh, wow. Okay. If I can make it through that, cause that was terrifying <laughs> how quickly she came. And mm. so I was like, if I can make it through that, I can do anything mm-hmm. that I want to. Does that mean that I want to go out and jump out of a plane? No, but I know I could, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
I have no interest in that. That's not my thing. Yeah. Um, I always talk about, I'm pretty fearless. Yeah. When it would become where I'd have to walk on a tightrope between the Grand Canyon. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> I don't know that I could pull that one off just out of sheer fear of heights and which I know is irrational and yet <laughs> it's still there, which is what makes it a phobia. Cause it's irrational, right? I think it's rational. <laughs> I know. Right. So for me, the power of those words is what really holds people back. And which is great. Cause when I have a conversation with a prospective client, one of the questions I ask them is, so what is holding you back right now? And I would say 95% of the people who I talk to, and I ask that question of, their answer is always me. I'm holding myself back, right? So they've identified themselves as their limiting factor. And so that really often becomes, okay, so how do we make that change? How are you going to change your own limitations? So we talk about that quite a bit, but not always in necessarily those terms, because that's too scary for a lot of people. Yeah. I start with people that do that with, that's why I'm so into expectations because I believe it is the core of our being. I believe that that was the seed that was planted in us by God, that we've become so created. What has gotten us from being a caveman to a digital age has been this expectation that we always can be more, that we always can be more. It's when we stilt it with, I can't, or I Uh won't, I won't, I don't want to, Right. that you really stop your creative juices flowing in your body and your brain. And that's why I start at that point, because I like to get back to the basics and rebuild people and restore. So that's just a little bit I was going to throw in about my working with expectations. No, I think that's a great point is that if you can start with the belief of I can do anything, it's just what do I want to do, right? There's a big difference between saying I can't do that or I choose not to. Yeah, I learned it at nine years old because of moving. Because my parents moved this from a very urban area where I played baseball. It was my identity. It was who I was going to be. Uh huh. Going to be a professional baseball player. Right. And we moved to this very rural area in upstate New York where there was no neighbors. I mean, my neighbor's neighbor was three, or three to four miles away and they were 90. They didn't have kids that I could play with. So I was there by myself with my sister and she wasn't going to play baseball. She was playing with dolls. So Right. <laughs> So for me, I became very lonely, abandoned, because my parents were going through big changes in their life. And I was feeling very abandoned. And I went to this hilltop, laid on my back and had a conversation with God. And Mm -hmm. that is where I heard the words, just be faithful. And I have always lived by that. And I started, after many, many trips up that hill, I got the confidence to be who I wanted to be and knew I was in control of that went in Mm. the Marine Corps and that kind of stuff. But how you believe in your faith and your expectations are so attached to each other. It's that challenge of not until we're challenged, do we really start exploring ourselves? And I did it at nine years old. And you sound like you did it at 15. Right. Some people never do it their whole life. I know. I know. I love the title of this podcast that it's Shower Epiphanies. And when I was telling my boyfriend I was going to be on this podcast, he was like, oh yeah, I do have the greatest thoughts in the shower, right? (laughs) The reason that I named it that was for that very reason, because everybody you talk to, you'll say, I have these thoughts. And then my next question is, what do you do with them? Mm -hmm. Oh, I just forget them. I I just don't think about them. And I read one of your blogs, which I love to death about doing it, just doing it. So many people get hung up in just discarding their thoughts. And I call them wants, needs, and desires because that's what lie really deep inside of each and every one of us. We all have wants, we all have needs, we all have desires. And when you discard those and you do it continuously, you get into a pattern. But when you start living them, your wants, needs, and desires, when I die, I am going to be the happiest man dying because Mm. I have done everything I've wanted to do in my life. If I haven't been successful at it, at least I can say I tried it. Oh, I love that. And I just do. When I speak to high schools, I I end my speeches at high schools with, just go out and just start doing it and go make doo-doo all over the earth. (laughs) (laughs) I love that. 
So I'm sure they love it too. I get the same reaction from them that I got out of you, a hearty, heartfelt laugh. But I've had kids write me back and say, yeah, I remember you saying that. And I remember how important it is to keep just doing. You will never fail if you keep doing. I agree. The failure is in stopping and ignoring. Yes, exactly. And that's one of the questions that I get from direct sales prospective clients is I feel like I'm a failure. And I'm like, well, have you given up on the business yet? And they say no. And I'm like, well, then you're not a failure. Yeah. It just means you're readjusting course and you're here talking to me. And so you're talking to a great navigator now. (laughs) No one ever fails in direct sales unless they quit. That's the only way you can fail. Exactly. The giving up. Now, sometimes I understand that there are times when it's like you're not in the right place. You're not in the right thing. And so that's not a failure. That's just recognizing that you're in the wrong place or this is not the right time for you right now because maybe life is happening and you've got to set something aside, right? So I have that conversation with some people too, because they go, well, I feel like I got to let something go and I can't let my family go and I can't let my relationships go. So sometimes I say, you know, look, if you want to set that aside, that's the great thing about direct sales is you can always go pick it back up or go pick another company or go pick a different product that you have more passion for. It's really about letting this business not run you, but you should run your business and allowing it to fuel who you are and fuel your, as you said, wants, needs, and desires. And if it's not fueling those things right now, then it's detracting from you. So you need to set that aside for the time being. And sometimes that happens. But for the most part, for the ones who are really wanting to rock it in their business, it's about, okay, so how do I take over the business? How do I run the business instead of letting it run me? Yeah, and I've seen people who have been in one business Mm -hmm. and they weren't successful, go to another business, not be successful, and then go to another business. And then all of a sudden they're the top producer. I mean, I know someone like that. And one of my questions to them was, what did you do different? And it came back to that they identified that it was their belief system. They didn't believe in the two companies and their belief system in the third company was just off the charts. Right. I mean, they just blew it up. Yeah. Just like in any business, this isn't just true for direct sales. This is true for any business owner or any business professional. When you have a passion for what it is you're offering, whether it's a product or service, it doesn't matter. When you've got a passion for that and whether or not someone signs the contract or buys your product or pays for your services, it doesn't matter. It's you're out there looking to help the world by providing this and you're just looking to identify where making the connection with your ideal client, it becomes easier. It's not a... Has anyone ever inspired you to discover a happier, healthier, and more fulfilled you? It is a magical experience, isn't it? Inspiration is indeed very powerful, yet it's often undermined. It can lift you from the ground to the sky in no time. Have you ever thought about returning the favor by inspiring the people around you? If you don't think you have it in you, we have good news for you. Art Costello's online course has everything you need to learn to supercharge yourself and shape your character into a powerful personality. Get ready to discover your strengths and unleash the creativity within. Don't believe it? Check it out yourself by signing up for this life-changing course at expectationacademy.com. That's expectationacademy.com. Chore to go do it. That's very true. Who along the way has influenced you? Who has been your big influencers? Oh my gosh. Well, of course, my parents have been great. My dad, like I said, was an officer in the Air Force. And then when he left the Air Force, he started his own business. So I got that entrepreneurial spirit from him. My mom was a stay-at-home mother, just out of necessity, because when you're moving that often, trying to maintain a job (laughs) was a little difficult. Just unpacking the boxes would be... (laughs) Right, exactly. With four kids, two dogs, a cat, and two vehicles. Yeah, it's a lot of work to do that. But even with all of that going on, every base we went to, she would join an organization. And looking back, I'm impressed that my mom, in those short periods of time, was such a leader that oftentimes within a few months, she was often 
joining the leadership team of the organization that she was a part of. So the, whether it was the officer's wife club or the choir of the church we were at, it didn't oftentimes all of a sudden she was the choir director or all of a sudden she was the president of the organization or the secretary treasurer or something. Very quickly, she is a servant leader. And so I learned that from her. That's been an influence. And it was just, again, I learned it by watching. It wasn't something that she set out. I don't know. I'll have to ask her. She set out to teach me servant leadership on purpose or if she just lived it and I just learned it from seeing it all the time. Would it matter? It doesn't matter, really. No, it doesn't matter. But for me personally, I'd love to know, hey, (laughs) did you know you taught me that? And were you intending that? (laughs) Do you know what? Your mother will probably love to know that. Exactly. That's what some parents don't realize is that their kids watch every single move they make. Whether you think they are or you think they're not, they are watching everything. And- everything. And you know what taught me that was my little girl. My youngest is six years old for Christmas. The last two Christmases, she has requested makeup because she likes to play makeup. <laughs> and so this year we got her some more makeup to play with. And she said, well, mom, there's no foundation. You always put foundation on. So I said, okay, well, I've got some tinted moisturizer. I'll let you use that. How about that? And so I went to go give her the tinted moisturizer. And instead of putting her hands out in front of her to like you would for lotion or something, she put her hand out so that the back of her hand was facing up because she had seen me when I put my foundation on, I put the liquid foundation on the back of my hand. And then I use a brush to brush it on my face because that's what I was taught by my makeup lady. Right. (laughs) So, and I realized I didn't teach her that on purpose. She learned it from watching me. And that's when I had the aha moment of, oh my gosh, my kids are watching literally everything I do, including how I put my makeup on. So if they're watching me do that, they're watching me do all these other things yes, they and are. picking up on all of them. So that was a big aha moment for me. Mm-hmm. But some of my other influencers, just to go back to the previous question, my parents, of course, first and foremost influencers, recently my biggest influencers have been coaches. Because five years ago, I didn't realize coaching existed. I didn't know what it was. And here I am, I was already coaching in my business. I just didn't know that's what I was doing. And as soon as I found out what it was, I was like, okay, (laughs) this is where every signpost in my life has been pointing me towards is to do this because I was a teacher for a number of years in my twenties. And so a coach is a little bit of educator a tiny bit of therapy, a t- you know, little bit of a counselor, but also the accountability portion, I think is what really makes a great coach. And so I was learning and including all of those things into who I was. And once I figured that out, I was like, all right, coaching it is. That's where I'm meant to be. This is who I am. So coaches in various industries, because none of them do the same thing. So they've all been quite influential to me. And then I'd say in the last probably three years, the most influential person has been my best friend. She's helped me through an incredibly difficult time because I'm in the process of finalizing a divorce right now. And that was really hard to go through. And so she's really helped me maintain sight of who I am through all of this. And even though it's not a knockdown drag out divorce, we actually get along very well. It's still the going through the process of redefining the relationship to say, okay, this isn't what I thought it was. This is what it is. So how do I move my mental shift from being what I thought it was to what it really is? You change your expectations. Exactly. When I'm working with divorce couples, I do that. We talk a lot about the divorce expectations versus marriage expectations. And the whole thing with me on expectations is that unmet expectations are the root of all disappointment. I mean, somebody has a quote out, I think it was Shakespeare or somebody that had a quote like that, but it is a truth. And that's why it's so important to learn to manage your expectations. So going through a divorce and separation, if you can learn how to manage your expectations, it will go a lot smoother for you. I definitely agree with that. And for me, it definitely was this shift of realizing, okay, this isn't what I thought it was going to be. I'm no longer who I thought I was going to be. He's no longer who we thought he was going to be. And so it's a shift of that expectation. And what's interesting is 
as we've been telling people that we're divorcing, so many people are, because of their expectations of what divorce is, Mm -hmm. they're often shocked when I say, oh, well, right now we still live together. (laughs) (laughs) Just not in the same way, right? (laughs) We've got two little girls who want mommy and daddy around. So Mm -hmm. we're doing things differently. And when people go, well, isn't that weird? Yeah, I guess if you're going to hold the expectation that all divorced people must hate each other. And if you're holding on to that, yes, then living together would be weird, but we don't hate each other. And frankly, I'm of someone who's like, I don't care what you think of my situation because I'm the one who has to live it, not you. It's always right. I mean, that is correct. Yeah. They don't live your life. That's why it's so important not to let other people's expectations dictate your behavior. Exactly. And so when people who are more introverted or whatever, or maybe even have social anxiety will ask me, well, how can you do that? Most polite way for me to put it is I don't care (laughs) what other people think because I'm the one who has to live my life. I'm the one who at the end of each day goes, was this a day that I can put in the wind column? Do I feel good about today? In no part of me saying, was today a good day? Do I put into consideration what other people think of me? I always reference it it, this way that it's not that I don't care what other people think of me. Is it that I choose not to let that influence me? Right. You know, that's how I approach that thing because I think in a way we all do care what people think of us. It's whether you let it influence you that matters. That's true. Very true. I agree. I love that little quote that says, what other people think of me is none of my business. (laughs) That's It's a good one. Right. (laughs) Good or bad, it's none of my business. What you think of me is none of my business. And I'm able to do that because I also don't hold judgment of others because I don't know their story. I don't know what they've been through, why they would make a decision to do X, Y, or Z. It's not my point. It's not my position. It's not my job Mm -hmm. to judge people. It's my job to support them where they are. If it's a friend, it's my job or expectation that I help them move forward as a friend, be there to support them. And so I don't hold judgment because that's just not my place. Let's talk about that because I think it's really important for our listeners to hear this. Yeah. How did you get to the point where you shunned judgments of others? Because I'm very much that way too. I don't place judgment on it. Do you think it's our understanding of things because we've been trained in coaching and in psychology and that kind of thing? It probably stems from the fact that, of course, back in high school, part of the reason I was so introverted and quiet at my first school is because I personally felt judged. I personally felt that other people were judging me. And so I didn't want that either. And one of my best friends in college, she said something that has stuck with me to this day. And we're still best friends as well, just so you know. But she said something that I won't let gender get in the way of who I fall in love with, right? Because that's part of the whole judgment. It's about the person, not their gender, right? And so for me, I think that all falls within the judgment pieces. I don't want to be judged, so I don't judge others. Yeah, I think that that's very true. And I think that that's probably a bigger influence than our education in coaching and everything. Because when you were saying that, I was thinking about, man, that is true for me too. In high school, I was judged and my parents were judged. And we were actually shunned in the little town that we're... I only had 20 kids in my class. Wow. So you know how that goes. I mean, everything. everybody knows everybody's business. Oh, yeah. And we were literally shunned because we were considered outsiders. And I just went to my 50th reunion a couple of years ago. Yeah. And it was interesting. I had somebody come up and say to me, did you ever know why we all shunned you and everything and we didn't talk to you and everything? And I said, is it the same reason right now why everybody is on one side of the room and I'm over here by myself. And they said, well, we were told when you moved to this little community here that your parents were running from the mafia. (gasps) (laughs) And our parents told us, do not associate with them because you could end up getting shot or killed. Oh, no. What's so amusing about it is we're Irish. There's a Costello that's Irish, not Italian. Frank Costello back in the 50s was a big mafia guy in New York. And that's where that came from. Oh, no. This horrible misconception led to that. Oh, my gosh. And judgment. Yeah, the judgment that came from it. Yeah, so for me, I want to be a safe space for people who are around me, which is why I think so many people are drawn to me. And I'm sure you probably hear this quite often, 
you're talking to a stranger, not just someone, you're talking to a stranger within five minutes, you know their whole life story. Because when you are a safe space, when you are open and non judgmental, people pick up on that subconsciously and then they don't have a problem holding back and they will share anything and everything with you, whether or not you ask. <laughs> I know the feeling. (laughs) Right, exactly. So I prefer to hold that space of non-judgment and being open to people, being who they are, because I also want to be in a space and I hope that other people hold that space for me where they are non-judgmental, open-minded to who I am instead of expecting me to be whatever. Because a lot of people would probably look at a biography of me and think that I'm typical soccer suburban mom. And there's all kinds of things they don't know about me that I'm not going to put in my professional bio that I hope they wouldn't judge me for, right? So I hold that space for others because I want them to do the same for me. Yeah. When I think about that, one of the things I thought about when you talked about your roommate and love, I also believe that love knows no boundaries. There's no boundaries in it. It's the limitations that we put on it that really make all the difference. People have all kinds of reasons for doing that. But there's a lot of truth in the quote that love is boundless. There's just no boundaries to it. And I care about people so much. And I use the word, I love you very often with friends. And my wife could get very jealous of that because she could think, golly, you know, you have all these friends and you're on the phone with them, you know, and they say, I love you, you know, when you say goodbye and people would be jealous. She's not. She does not get jealous about it. And she calls them, hey, Here's your girlfriend calling from so far place. Right. <laughs> she's so good about it. We get so, so, I'm so grateful that she is the way she is because she lets me be who I am. Exactly. And, and I think that's when you're in the right relationship, you get to be who you are without fear, without judgment. And knowing that you're accepted for who you are is more powerful than the societal expectation of what love is. Ah, amen, sister. (laughs) (laughs) Hey, I got one more thing I want to really discuss with you because I'm interested in your viewpoint on it. Sure. I have this thing about labels because I believe that the labels that are placed upon us are what limit us. Mm -hmm. We've done some research and surveys in prisons, and we found that 90% of prisoners, whether regardless of their gender, their color, what they were in prison for or whatever, 90% of them were told as children, you're going to end up in jail. Wow. Wow is right. So when we have teachers that say one kid's smarter than another kid and Mm -hmm. people call people dumbass and all kinds of weird things. Right. But we start to believe those labels. Yes. You You got any feelings on labels? Absolutely. I was very lucky that when I was in college or actually... I had already graduated from college and went back to school to become a teacher because I didn't know what I wanted to be when I graduated college the first time. I read a story about a teacher. She was a first-year teacher. And when she got her student list, she noticed there were numbers next to their names. And she didn't know what the numbers were. But they were all numbers that ranged anywhere from 120 to 145. And so she's looking at all these numbers and she said, oh, well, maybe that's their IQ. So she taught all of these kids as if they had IQs of 120 to 145, which if you know anything about IQ, that ranges from genius, bright (laughs) all the way up to genius, right? So we're talking gift. She treated her kids as if they were gifted, okay? At Christmas break, the principal comes to her because now they've had two report cards and the principal says, these kids are doing so well with you and you're a first year teacher. How are you doing this? And she said, well, these are all really bright kids. I mean, I'm shocked that you're shocked that they're getting all A's. I don't understand it. And come to find out that the numbers next to those kids' names were their locker numbers, (laughs) not their IQ. And it turns out that these kids, a majority of them were actually learning disabled or were labeled as learning disabled. And so from that, I took away from that, that you should never take that label and assume that it means something. So I actually don't like the term learning disabled. So when somebody tells me that their child has LD, which is the short Mm -hmm. abbreviation for learning disability, I say, oh, so your child learns differently. Mm -hmm. 
And I've said that ever since I heard that story. So your child learns differently and they go, no, 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 my child's learning disabled. I'm like, no, 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 no. Your child learns differently. Disability implies that your child can't learn. Can your child learn? Mm -hmm. Oh, well, yeah. Does your child learn the same way other kids do? No. So your child learns differently. We just have to figure out how to support how your child learns. That's right. And so the labels, I think, really do define and limit if you're going to allow that to happen. So there are very few labels that I will ascribe to myself past mother and friend, (laughs) mother, friend, and coach. (laughs) But even coach can be somewhat limiting because people have assumptions of what that is. Yeah. I just, this week on when one of my podcasts posted, it's with Kristen Schmedley from Philadelphia, who has two sons that are, have a genetic blindness. Uh Two different ages, two sons that are blind. And I did an interview with her because she is so powerful with expectations. She made a decision and a choice to refuse to have her children treated as blind. They now play baseball. They don't play it the same. Right. She convinced the community that she lives in in Philadelphia that while they were learning how to play baseball, they were going to have to alter the game because of their challenges. Right. A tremendous story. She's raised millions and millions of dollars for the organization that her children are part of. But the story to me was her expectation to have her children treated as normal. I mean, they do well academically. They're in mainstream school. They're doers and they just think differently about their challenges. Exactly. When we let the outside world and organizations dictate how we're going to raise our child, Mm -hmm. She's living proof that it makes a difference of challenging what's norm because exactly children are so resilient. They can do things. And when they learn and are encouraged to learn and think differently, Mm -hmm. tremendous things can happen for them. I agree. That is a great thing. Well, we're nearing the end of our time. And I always like to ask my guests, What is the one tidbit of information that you would like to leave on this earth when you're gone? How would you want to be a difference maker? I would say that the legacy I would want to leave would be to hold that space for others that you want held for you. So if you want grace, if you want open-mindedness, if you want loving, if you want whatever it is that you want, hold that space for others if that's what you want held for you. Jeannie Bellinger, those are powerful words. That's very powerful. Thank you. And I really, really appreciate that. Shower Epiphany listeners, Jeannie Ballinger, where can we find out all about you? Well, you can find me on Facebook, of course, because a billion people in the world are on Facebook, right? You can find me on Facebook. My business is called Level Up Coaching LLC. So I'm on Facebook as facebook.com slash level up coach LLC. And you'll see my smiling face there with my purple dress on. And so that's how you know you found me. My website is levelupcoachllc.com. So if you want to see the blog entry that Art was referencing, that blog entry is on my website. And I put blogs up about once a month or so. And once this podcast goes live, I'll blog all about it. (laughs) (laughs) Well, thank you, Jeannie. We appreciate it. And God bless you, and I hope everything works out just the way you expect it to. Don't know which direction you want your life to take? Are you sinking deep down into the pit of uncertainties day by day? So, what's the secret to leading a happy, satisfied life? It's taking matters into your own hands. But what if the matters in question are a total blur? Art Costello's Expectation Academy course aims to tell you exactly how you can get some clarity in your life. This course can be your savior on your journey to reinventing yourself. While you certainly can't plan your whole future ahead, you can definitely control twists and turns your life takes. So what are you waiting for? Sign up for this course now at expectationacademy.com. Get a chance to broaden your horizons and add meaning to your life. That's expectationacademy.com. Oh, thank you. Same to you, Art. Bye-bye, everybody. Thanks for listening to the show. Drop us your comments and questions with what you want answered on the show. You can subscribe on iTunes and Binge Network. 
You can also get more information on the website, expectationtherapy.com.